Today's presenter, Russell Jackman, is a graduate of the McGeorge School of Law, University of Pacific, and was admitted to the State Bar of California in June of 1994. He has been vice chair of the California State Bar's Law Practice Management and Technology Committee and a member since 1996. He works specifically with law offices and attorneys that need to get the most out of their legal technology and creates PowerPoint presentations for opening statements, direct examinations, and closing statements to be used in court and can work with attorneys directly to filter their documents and images so that they have the most powerful visual presentations possible. He also works with law offices and solo attorneys to upgrade their older systems to new ones, troubleshooting existing setups and training attorneys and staff on Microsoft programs. He is available for remote access consulting on technology related issues. So please feel free to contact him at any time. Hello, my name is Russell Jackman, and the course that we're going to have today is called Demystifying Cybersecurity. Um, uh, I'd like to give a very quick introduction of myself. My name is Russell Jackman. I'm an attorney that's been specializing in uh, cybersecurity and technology law uh, since the uh, early 90s. And um, I'm very interested in this whole subject of cybersecurity, especially with the recent developments in the GDPR or the uh, uh, General Data Protection Regulations Act of uh, Europe, uh, which was a couple of years ago, and also the California Privacy Act, which is uh, coming into effect this year, um, but is really being felt out, and 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 the repercussions of which are going on more uh, in in the next year. Um, it all involves the uh, subject of cyber threats. And uh, for a lot of people, it seems like a very mystifying subject. They don't really understand what's going on. And so this lecture is going to be a uh, help for people who really aren't very technical to understand what's going on and what we can do about it. So um, here is an overview of what we'll be talking about. First, we'll be explaining what cybersecurity is all about. We'll uh, explain how did we get to this point, okay? And then we want to know what are the types of current threats that are out there and how big is the risk, really? Who are the targets? And of course, as um, uh, an attorney, you can already be aware that the law firms are among those targeted because of their large resources of information. And then where is this all leading us? And then finally, what can I do to protect myself and my business? So first, we probably hearken to a man who is soon going to be unemployed like uh, a lot of people in the print business, and that is Alfred E. Newman and Mad Magazine. Um, he used to have his famous quote, which is, what me worry. And the general attitude that we see uh, as a computer security professional uh, with a lot of my clients is that a lot of them feel that what me worry about cybersecurity, they'll never hack me. And of course, that it's a foolish, no, it's a foolish notion to worry about, um, uh, to say what me worry about anything. And especially when it comes to cybersecurity, people that take a lax attitude toward it are usually the ones that suffer the most when there is a significant breach or a problem with uh, technology. And in the legal world, it's, and we'll be discussing a little bit later, it's particularly a problem because of the fact that attorneys and law offices have a higher standard of care. They are being given information that puts them more under the uh, 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 realm of the uh, uh, GDPR and or California Privacy Act and or whatever privacy acts there are. Plus, there are other factors that make being an attorney and dealing with cybersecurity an even greater challenge. The one attitude you can never really have is the what me worry about cybersecurity because when you take that attitude, that's when you're going to be the most susceptible. When you think you're the safest and that you can't be hacked into, is probably the most likely time that you'll be hacked. So, 
Cyber threats are definitely real. Master is only a click away. And I, I'm i sure that I wouldn't be the first one to ever bring up the concept of somebody saying, well, everything was going great on my machine. And then I clicked on an email that told me that I had a credit report and um, I was uh, uh, curious what they had to say about it. So I downloaded it and now my machine doesn't work. Or, you know, there's uh, situations where people are sent um, uh, attachments from people that they do know and that they were expecting. Um, I've been sent Adobe Acrobat files, for instance, or what seemed to be Adobe Acrobat files from people that I knew that I was expecting to get a file from, but they were hacked. And fortunately, I called them up and asked them, hey, uh, were you planning on sending this to me? And then they said no, because something did seem wrong with the message. And lo and behold, they were hacked. So, and you'd be surprised at how many uh, hacking incidents can be short circuited uh, if a person just phoned up another person and said, "Were you expecting this attachment, or were you expect? Did you send me this attachment?" Cybersecurity is a top business risk worldwide in 2017, and um, it's only gotten worse in 2018 and 2019. We don't have all the numbers yet, but it's certainly become uh, as bad as a tornadoes and floods and fires and theft of physical kind because these are things that can happen 24 hours a day. There's no season for it, and, and it's getting harder and harder for businesses to protect themselves when they're on online 24 hours a day. Cyber losses of $400 billion in 2000. CEO estimate grows to two trillion dollars in 2019, and that you can see it's exponential in only a few years. Mainly because the experts who do this kind of hacking know better than anyone else now how to get it done, and they're seeing that they're getting away with it without anyone doing anything about it. So it's it's become a much larger element. Plus the amount of people that are now using the internet on a continuous basis for business is grown tremendously. And all of that leads to a much larger amount of cyber threats and cyber crime that's going on. And so what do we have at risk? We have capital and property, obviously, we can be at risk from cyber criminals. The business continuity is a big problem. In other words, when you're offline because you've been hacked or when you get uh, your customers know that they couldn't get certain things taken care of and the excuse is because they were hacked, it hurts your reputation. The direct costs of response are obviously significant. So getting in, finding out what went on and then getting um, someone to help out f from a, you know, a situation where the uh, response uh, was not taken care of uh, is really going to be a problem for most people. And so uh, they're going to have to deal with that as part of the entire expense. And then brand name and value is just a huge uh, uh, problem, is that you don't want to be associated with being one of the retailers or a small business that gets hacked or say it's a law firm that gets hacked and loses a lot of critical client information. It all can be very damaging to your uh, yourself and, and competition can pick up on it and try to take advantage and take clients away from you based on, on the problems that you had. And that goes again to, to your reputation overall in the community, your ability to uh, keep things private and your ability to show that your customers, your clients, or whoever you work with, that that information is being, it goes right out the window. Customer confidence lost because customers won't want to necessarily entrust their information with somebody that has these kind of Say data safety problems. And so we talk about anyone having a digital footprint as a target. And that means that, uh, that basically we're all pretty much aware that technology is changing the way the world works. There's so many places now where 10 years ago the internet wasn't present, but it is currently. Um, and we're not just talking, you know, 
on your cell phone and, and your iPad and your laptop. We're talking about the Internet of Things here. So we're talking about printers and we're talking about uh, uh, refrigerators even. And, and we're talking about uh, home heating systems and home security systems and Alexa and, and uh, uh, Siri and the other things that people are using around them 24 hours a day to be connected to a technology database. Well, for Alexa to be able to listen for its name to be said out in the world, to be said Alexa, it has to be listening to everything else that you're saying. So you can see that's where an issue is right there is it, it, it now it's supposed to be not doing anything with the conversations that it's hearing until it hears the word Alexa but that doesn't mean it doesn't have the capacity of recording it and so that creates a much greater challenge for people that they really weren't thinking about when they said oh how cute it would be to have a little robot listening to you 24 hours a day listening for its name so privacy versus security is always an ongoing discussion and problem. And uh, uh, I often compare it to the uh, New York City door lock, which if you've seen it in sitcoms or you actually live in New York, a lot of people have that front door in their apartment that's bolted and screwed and has a, a, a bar that you lay across the front and a chain and... A, uh, a bunch of other different locks. It, that's great until you want to necessarily pick up a delivery or go get your mail down the hallway. Then you have to undo the locks, the whole deal, and then make sure that you lock everything up on the way back. There's there's obviously going to always be a, a an issue between computer security and your uh, privacy, um, and also the fact that the convenience is also going to be a big factor. I mean, if you raise security levels to a point where your privacy is totally protected, are you going to need like two-step verification? Are you going to need a a little changing password on a key fob that, that you have to program in every 20 minutes or something going along those lines? And then also there's the concept that if something is too private, does that allow for criminals to be able to create crimes that nobody can trace back? On the other hand, don't you want security so that people can, don't break into your stuff and steal it? So that's a big problem. The laws just can't keep up with tech changes and access to information. Uh, as we know, the legislative process takes days, it takes years for something to happen when a computer problem can happen within days and create you know a worldwide problem that nobody can can solve with the uh, current laws the way they are and so you know we're seeing even a fast tracked law case usually take about two years to go through the courts and in two years obviously a whole lot of significant changes can happen in the the uh the tech industry um so it will always be a a battle between privacy someone being able to keep something super private that nobody can access and security because we necessarily want to be able to uh uh know if somebody is going to commit a bomb plot or there's child porn or something along those lines we need to have access to that to stop criminals. But on the other hand, people don't want everyone to be able to access everything that they've got because that can cause a lot of problems too. So here's calendaring of recent cybersecurity attacks we've seen. For instance, Facebook in March of 2018, uh, that was the Cambridge Analytica situation where we've seen that they took uh, uh, Facebook and they used it for political gain in the 2016 U.S. elections. And there were 50,000 users affected. And Facebook lo lost value um, in March based on uh, when the news came out. People were very upset about it and sold their stock. And in the end, uh, the whole stock market dropped 300 that day. 
it had something to do, you know, because Facebook being a major leader in all of the, uh, 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 just the internet entirely, it's, you know, a, a big, when it has a problem, it, the, the repercussions are felt across the U.S. And then Zuckerberg's worth fell by billions just in one, one day. Not that a lot of people said that he didn't deserve it, but, and that he's probably earned it all back by now. But even so, you can see the implications of something like that. Now, here's a list of other huge cyber attacks that we've had happen. We won't go through um, every specific part of each one of these things, but they're all pretty well known, um, especially things like Target and eBay and Equifax and Yahoo. Yahoo, of course, was over a two-year period and three billion people were affected and it did knock off $350 million of its purchase price was finally sold. So something like that, if you wanted to just look at that alone as being a major element um, as to the devaluation of a company that got caught um, uh, with its pants down cybersecurity wise was a huge issue. And then, um, you know, as far as the target uh, stores were concerned. Um, they've estimated that since 2013, a billion dollars of total uh, costs due to were lost due to customer confidence, a lack of customer confidence in Target and the way they handled the credit situation. It's not always that you've been hacked that's the problem because people are beginning to get to be sadly a little bit more accepting of understanding that the companies are getting hacked but it's that none of these companies did anything to say what they were going to do to catch who is responsible and they're not doing anything to guarantee that this won't happen again that's why we're seeing so much lost co customer uh, confidence even years later after this occurred so let's talk about the magnitude of cyber risk. Um, the total number of breaches um, has increased 44.7%, uh, okay? So in the last year for uh, 2017, they showed that there were 1,579 breaches and that cost companies, um, uh, an average cost of breach was estimated at 665,000. So they're saying that large companies were uh, usually uh, cost them about $3.2 million per incident. Okay. That's a whole lot of, of costs in one, it's, you know, for an incident. Um, uh, also that we see that uh, the average cost of crisis services was 357,000 and the cost of uh defense was almost 700,000 um settling these costs were about 255,000 it's just an average um obviously there were people paying even more than that and then there are a lot of these things that didn't get reported especially some of the, the biggest ones so they're saying that out of uh 323 people in the United States, 1 billion records were exposed. So that's about a little over three records per person, man, woman, and child in the United States. The three records for yourself was exposed to who knows who. You don't know. We don't know. And we don't know what they're doing with them. But usually it's never for any sort of good purpose. And that's including every man, woman, and child that you know. So it's 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 really the numbers are very staggering, and it's not something to be taken lightly. Um, problem with security's timing, and that is that the compromise happens within minutes, but it takes months to detect, or at least days to detect what's going on, and then. What are you going to do about it? And that's one of the things that is a big part of the uh, GDPR is not only um, do they look into when you were hacked, but your response is very important. They give you only 72 hours before they start finding you when you have 
uh, knowledge of a cyber attack done anything about it so the fact that you you know the right now it says most detections take 200 days by the fbi to to uh, uh go and detect find out what happened it's just not satisfactory enough and so that's why it's really important for uh anyone that has a privacy and security uh uh, issue. Uh, they need to get a plan in place where they can notify people within 72 hours, even if the detection is going to take a while. You know, you at least can inform your clients that a hack has been ha has happened and that something is being done to try to rectify it. It's when you don't say anything at all that you things get out of control and you have a situation somewhat like Yahoo has where you have just so many days without, you know, uh, or years without anybody uh, doing anything about it. And it really got out of control. Um, so we're seeing, for instance, that the time to compromise versus the time to deal with it is it, it, it happens within minutes, but then to do anything about it takes days. And then to do uh, 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 by then the horse has already left the barn and the damage has already been done. Um, so here's what you have to consider when you have been hacked. Um, you have to think about where this has happened. So was it online or was it offline? We're seeing now that offline problems are almost as big or maybe if not bigger than the online ones. Uh, 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 disgruntled employees, uh, uh, people, you know, having their laptop get stolen and they never put a password on it. Um, people who, you know, write their uh, uh, passwords on sticky notes and temp workers come in and just look at them and take them. You know, it's it. you'd think that the, everything is all, you know, online hacking and, and people that break in. And it's certainly a large number of it. Maybe it's in the 75, 25 range. You know, 75% would happen online and 25% offline. But that 25% offline is usually very preventable and something that, when they realize that, that they could have done something about it and didn't do something about it makes them seem pretty bad. So you can see next under the who area, whether it was malicious or accidental or whether it's internal or external. Um, recently, there was a, uh, a uh, attack to uh, an insurance company locally, and it did turn out that it was accidental and it was internal where somebody uh, downloaded the wrong attachment and suddenly their whole system was completely shut down, including uh, three offices in uh, Northern California that were unable to uh, operate for several days based on uh, uh, the problems that were encountered by um, opening up that uh, malicious uh, uh, ransomware software. And then the what is really important too, because it, whether it's technology or whether it was media that was spilled or whether it was protected data, um, which could include confidential information. Um, so what is the thing that would be stolen by or compromised? And usually we're seeing more and more, it's the protected data and the confidential information that hackers are going for less than they're going to try to steal technology. And then finally, the financial impact is really large. So you have to look at, um, uh, uh, first of all, the event management expense. So just going and, and clearing up the hack itself and and dealing with um, any systems that were affected it's just a significant cost right there but then you have to look at any kind of legal liability and what it would take to hire attorneys to defend in lawsuits um, lost business expense and extra expense that comes involved when you are trying to deal with uh, uh, cleaning up from the hack um, and then We've talked about the defense expense and setting up systems to try to prevent this from happening in the future. And then finally, uh, which hasn't really been a um, situation yet, GDPR 
and with the California Privacy Act is that we're going to see regulatory fines and penalties for not being um, uh, compliant. And, you know, it's bad enough that you suffer, you know, all these other, you know, reputation problems and so forth. Um, but when you have a problem with uh, uh, your regulatory, regulatory fines on top of that, the repercussions could be devastating. So, uh, so this is a look at the uh, percentage of data breaches done by the type of attack. So um, you can see the different colors there. For instance, um, uh, 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 hacking, things like phishing, ransomware, and skimming gone up significantly, whereas physical theft, if you can see the blue line, is actually somewhat declining. And same with data on the move, people, you know, taking their data and, and running with it doesn't seem to happen that much any longer. And even the accidental web exposure um, is, it's still, you know, in the 10% the range, but it's not growing it's 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 getting less and less and even the employee and the negligence improper improper disposal it's just narrowly in the 10 percent range and the rest really is from the um uh phishing ransomware malware and skimming that's that's going to be your majority of what you have to 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 be concerned with when you're dealing with this stuff and then by industry sectors we're seeing um, that more and more just straight ordinary business is being targeted for these kind of attacks and less so um, items like uh, healthcare and banking and financial institutions, mainly because most of those industries have already done something to protect themselves from it. It's the more the standard business now that hasn't done much about it, especially in the legal area that has been causing a lot of problems for them. So who is doing the hacking? Well, we have like minor players, you know, the, the teenagers and the, and, and, and the uh, disaffected individuals that feel they need to, you know, make a statement by by hacking somebody and maybe making a little bit of money doing it. But we're seeing a lot more of organized criminals, major players, cartels, national and international getting involved. And then we're seeing competitors get involved um, and they can be major players now. They're doing this to undermine their competition, you know, find a hole at Achilles heel that exists for their competitors and let someone else come in and exploit it for them and take their opposition down. And then finally, we're seeing nations and economic, economic espionage, and those are some major players too. So um, the, close to the organized criminals, but we're seeing the actual, you know, uh, China uh, perhaps and, and some other uh, countries themselves just being interested in hacking the United States, um, not just from government to government level, but government to small business level, just so that they can uh, uh, maybe you know capitalize on 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 getting some economic advantage by doing that. And it's it's pretty unpleasant. Um, so how do breaches occur? Um, Mostly, most people feel that they're that it's accidental, and it and it is a lot of cases still. Um, we're we're dealing a lot of times with behavioral problems, which is why you know I've always said that that when you're coming up with a security policy, it's not always about um, uh, just talking about the technology issues at hand. You also have to take into consideration things like the human element and the behavioral issues. So you can't always just um, take it as a given that, you know, people will uh, act accordingly. So you have to need them, you need to get them to sign contracts so they agree to take privacy seriously and that they will uh, not compromise the uh, uh, clients um, by the actions that they do, not just the computer itself, but things like, you know, not posting things on social media or not talking about things, you know, in the workplace 
to uh, temporary workers that have to deal with long-term, you know, uh, uh, plans by the company, that sort of thing. Um, so, and then just the list of sloppy practices, you can probably guess what some of them are, but here's a quick little laundry list of what we have. Password protections, obviously, you know, people using password one, two, three, as they're and hey, that's my password. Don't use that one. Um, uh, uh, but you know they're they're using really predictable um, uh, passwords that like include their name or something like that, or you know, not requiring any kind of uh, uh, two-step verification type thing. So in other words, they just put in a name and password. They don't have to get a text sent to their phone and then have to answer it or have to do anything like that when they change passwords. Um, and then using the same password for many accounts. I mean, it's inevitable you're going to use some passwords over again because you don't want to have to learn new ones every time. But it is pretty tough if you have one password that's being used everywhere because if it does get stolen, you could have somebody who, have, who has king keys to the entire kingdom. Um, and um, so, you know, at least have like a rotation. I try to... Try to have um, no more than than like a password rotation of about four, three or four passwords that I use on a regular basis or a variant of so that, you know, because some places will lock you out after three attempts and that's not very good either. So you don't want to have 17 different ones or like one, my one client had a, a password that was, I, I think, 26 characters long. It's crazy to have to write every time this person wanted to get an email to type 26 characters, which in some cases was longer than the actual email they had to write. So just because they say you can make a 64 character password, it's a good idea to make a 64 character password. Um, a big deal, and this is one of the big changes now about Windows 10. Windows 7 and Windows 8 are basically being phased out, and for good reason because they allow you to manually install the patches and the updates when you felt like it um, for the operating system. And um, the GDPR looked at that and said, well, that's one of the major causes of hacking that goes on, is that not that you, Microsoft, hasn't, haven't done the work to fix the patches, you do, but by letting people choose when they wanted to update their machines or to avoid updating at all um, is a real problem. And they threatened to hold Microsoft responsible for the uh, hacking violations that occurred unless in their new operating system, Windows 10 at the time, they made it mandatory for updates to occur. And so Microsoft, you know, thought about it and said it's easier to, you know, make everyone main, uh, have a mandatory updating procedure um, than deal with the fines that the GDPR was going to level on them. And so now with um, Windows 10, you basically have to give it a time uh, that you're not working on the computer. You tell it you when you're your off work hours are, and then it will schedule a reset uh, and an and installation of those uh, patches uh, when you're, you know, not using the computer. So, or you can tell it to do it manually. You can manually do a restart and have it update your machine, you know, so you don't have to wait till that one uh, dead time happens. But the fact of the matter is you really can't go more than 24 hours without a uh, mandatory update unless you leave your computer shut completely off and not on the internet at all. Um, but as soon as it gets on the internet, Microsoft's going to warn it and warn you that you have to make this fix in, a, in order to, uh, you know, before you can use the computer again. And that's mainly because the GDPR wanted to make it so that people had to make those updates. And um, the, the only thing is that there are other programs out there, too, that need updating as well. Um, everything from, say, Chrome to uh, uh, Java and Flash and so forth, you need to sort of do on an a regular basis, not every day, using them every day, but certainly, you know, 
once every couple of months to make sure that there are the patches available for that. You know, Adobe would be another good um, example of something that doesn't automatically get fixed or updated when you have uh, Microsoft do their updates for uh, Office and or uh, uh, Windows. So, um, and then one sort of source of security protection is a situation where you can see a problem happening where say um, security is um, is internal, just say it's on, you know, on a Norton disk or something like that versus an external, external and, and system. So that the external ones are more like saying the firewalls or having some other uh, cloud-based protection versus one that was just locally saved on each person's hard drive. So that's that's certainly an interesting discussion. Right now, a whole lot more of it is internal, but it, it could be something that could be part of a trend in the future. And then uh, if it's intentional, if something was intentional, then you have to say to yourself, was it internal or was it external? And external, you know, that's, anyone can be hacked by that, but internal ones, you have to take very seriously because first of all, you know that it's someone in your office or in your company or in your group. So that kind of limits it a little bit as to who it could be. And also just knowing where you want to put your resources in, on an intentional thing. So if it's external, you really need to be doing an investigation, finding out who it is, you know, notifying maybe people that deal with that external um, uh, uh, hacker what you guys can do about it versus when it's internal, then you have to start worrying about your own employees is you to figure out, you know, was someone that you had years ago or someone that just worked there recently. And then, then you have to make the, the difficulty of uh, accusing um, them of uh, intentionally breaching your system, which obviously is not a pleasant situation. Then another situation that we see is that there's a lot of use of outdated technology going on there. And it's saying one in three businesses rely on outdated cybersecurity tools. And uh, that being said, in only in under a month and th uh, three quarters, uh, Windows 7 will no longer be getting any kind of security updates from Microsoft. And that basically, basically kills it as an operating system because um, uh, you don't want something that doesn't get patches or or doesn't get any kind of a notification from off from from Windows that it's got that's not up to date. If it's not up to date, then it's you're really not going to get any protection at all. Like so it's like parking your car in the middle of downtown San Francisco with the windows rolled down and the door is wide open and the glove compartment open and just saying, you know, take me for a ride. You know, your your the car that's on the front of your hood. Because the fact is, the, that's why they don't want to offer security patches anymore for Windows 7. Can't protect it anymore. It's too basic, and everyone already knows everything about Windows 7. So there's no special places to hide or to be able to protect it um, from cyber attacks. And because it's so compromised, that the uh, effort is to just phase it out and move on to Windows, and and in the meanwhile, moving Windows 8 kind of out of the way too there. So um, uh, 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 Windows 7 and the upgrade from Windows 7 is going to be a big deal. And if your office hasn't dealt with it, if it's not something that it's really con contemplated, it's something that they need to deal with very soon. Let's talk about the evolution of a data breach here. So from the discovery of an event, okay, all the way to the handling of long-term consequences. So when we discover an event, we find out that confidential information um, has been given up to the control. We find that, we first find out that there's confidential information to control of, but then that would be like their health information, identifiable information in corporate confidential information. Now, personally identifiable information is a whole new term of art 
that was created by the um, uh, 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 GDPR. And it's, it used to be, uh, in, especially in America, we thought that the protected information was name, uh, maybe uh, uh, your uh, mailing address, certainly your credit card information and your driver's license. But mostly we're thinking credit card number and driver's license and social security number. Those were the the more important ones and everything else was basically considered public domain and if you had it, you do whatever you want with it. But Europe isn't taking that tax with us. And so they have a definitely different view of what makes for information and something that you aren't allowed to do anything with unless you have permission. So, um, uh, so the that happens after a data breach is that you look to evaluate the event and you do a forensic investigation and a legal review of it okay um so uh you you uh first have to manage the short-term crisis by giving some notification to your clients and to monitor their credit to make sure that their situation you know, and your own credit to make sure that you're not seeing any fluctuations in it you need to tell your clients to to check their credit to make sure that they're not seeing any weird fluctu fluctuations and you may even have to pay for your clients credit reporting just so that you can have peace of mind and say look i we did with it as much as we could as soon as we knew there was a problem Okay, and then there has to be a legal review of the event being done, and you have to figure out, well, did it do that? Um, and then um, uh, what is going to be the, the toughest thing, too, is uh, dealing with things like uh, the long-term consequences, such as uh, class action lawsuits, regulatory fines and penalties, reputational damage and income loss. Those are all significant and even doing things like the uh, uh, public relations can be part of both the long-term and the short-term consequences not going to be good to have to explain to people why this happened and what you're going to do about it and how soon they can expect the problem to be fixed but you know if it was your information you'd want the same thing so let's talk for a few minutes about what do they want well mostly they want money so that's the crux of all evil, isn't it? And it's what most bad guys want when they are trying to hold people for ransom. That's what ransomware is, right? Um, one client of mine um, had a friend who was running a chiropractic practice and eight of her practices, she had a chain, were all held up by uh, 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 ransomware uh, bullies. And uh she could not they the she tried to get someone that was uh an authority to try to hack or to undo it and they could not do it and so they basically had to pay eight thousand dollars per uh 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 area per per store uh to get their data back and so that you know was sixty four thousand dollars you know um and but they said that the, otherwise that information would have been gone and there was nothing that anyone who even you know people who knew what they were doing could do about this it was such a significant hack so that was 64 grand and it was a lesson badly learned by that client and it's uh ransomware phishing and skimming um they're all part of the same package phishing is again a term used by people that are sending fake emails to other people saying, hey, you know, got your address or, you know, we we uh, have heard about you from, you know, it's the Microsoft um, uh, uh, scam where it's, it, you get a call from a Microsoft company, but it's not really a Microsoft company and they get access to your system and, and tear it all apart and take whatever they want. Um, so they also want information because this personal information that we're talking about, the personally identifiable information uh, is now something that we're seeing, especially when compiled in the aggregate is being sold to what's called blacklists out there where they will, you know, do say what is known as a fishing expedition. They'll find people that they think are suckers, 
them on a list and then send that list out to these big time hackers, which will hack them even more. Financial information, obviously, is very important. Um, and so if they can get it, they'll use it. Industrial research, we're seeing some of that more common now. We're seeing companies doing it for the sake of, well, we wanted to know this about th these folks or that about these folks, but they don't want to have to pay to do it legitimately. So they'll do it this way. And then we talked about it earlier, the, the ability to undermine your competition employ you know certain uh unsafe characteristics in these uh, uh ransomware situations so where is this leading us okay the victim of the cyber attack is now responsible for data theft if adequate cyber defense steps were not taken so it's an unfortunate scenario that we have cyber attack victims are held responsible for the breach it's actually we have so much trouble finding the criminal involved that we've turned it around and made the victim responsible for being a victim and it's kind of rough um so a bank that gets robbed is held responsible if they do not have good locks and a strong safe okay so what are the commercial expectations that we have of this the business continuity will it survive an attack and we have supply chain requirements of they got interrupted and then we need to know if uh, the vendors now are going to be able to hold cyber security safe and uh, 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 if they're going to be compliant with uh, things like the, the GDPR before you start working with them. Then there's this thing called the SOC audit, which is really sort of a, a Air where they go and they check the different levels of where your security is at. And if you don't have enough security in place, then they'll either recommend that you fix it or they won't do business with you. And then this has really become a really large element of uh, modern uh, 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 the, the, the modern day um, folks that are are dealing with computer security they have to deal with insurance implications so attorneys um uh uh, uh dentists and other professionals um doctors their insurance companies are saying to them if you can't prove you're hipaa compliant with your security and privacy if you can't um show as a law office that you're keeping your clients data protected um, if you're an accountant or another type of professional, they will not issue malpractice insurance if your security level is too low or you're just not aware of how it even works, which is mostly the case in a lot of situations. They can't, if you have to say, I don't know what my security is, I don't know how my data is being backed up, I'm not sure if I have ever had a problem and if I have, I don't think I ever notified anybody well if you are saying that back to your insurance company when if you were an insurance company would you insure yourself i guess that's a good question and if you heard somebody say back to you what you would be saying to your insurance company would that make you feel confident enough that you'd want to start insuring them or if you did start insuring them would you charge them a lot more money which is kind of the case here so the insurance implications are actually very very big and it's what is motivating a lot of people to become gdpr compliant or california privacy compliant even when they haven't heard anything from the uh GD gdpr authorities or the california privacy act authorities so um he speaking of the government there's a number of things that the federal government does to regulate um privacy as well and uh, iris publication 1345 is considered a very serious uh, matter in the accounting world um hipaa is obviously a huge element for doctors um the gdpr as i mentioned is the european one and probably has the most fleshed out concepts or what the or and how to comply and what the punishment is if you don't comply which is either a hundred million dollars up to a hundred million dollars or you get three uh, uh 
get three. They get up to four uh, percent of the uh, European um, uh, investment that you might have. Like if you have whatever you know assets in in Europe, they could uh, seize up to four percent of them. So um, it's certainly something you don't want to mess with. Um, California Privacy Act involves companies that have over $25 million in gross revenue. And so a lot of companies are saying, oh, well, I don't have $25 million in gross revenue, so I don't have to deal with the California Privacy Act. But what happens is that companies that do have 20, over $25 million in gross revenue are then standard where they need to look at their subcontractors to make sure that they aren't in compliance as well. Because if they aren't in compliance, then that's going to wind causing a leak that is usually going to cause these companies to become uh, 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 in violation of the California Privacy Act. So what happens is either under the GDPR or the California Privacy Act, the bigger companies are being arm wrenched by the governments to make their subcontractors and employees all adhere to both of these acts. And if that's the case, then it filters its way down to even the smallest company because if you do business with a larger company that is under the Privacy Act, you'll pr probably become under the Privacy Act as well. So, um, and it usually winds up being that the big companies will then say, well, if the, you as a smaller company can't prove to us that you, you are GDPR or Privacy Act compliant, we just won't do business with you or we'll fire you. And so that winds up getting the smaller companies to act in compliance as well. So a lot of people say, well, I could just answer my own computer questionnaire. It's not that big of a deal. What are they going to ask? Well, here's a typical computer security question that they do ask. ask asking for things like comprehensive, how comprehensive is your uh, assessment process for information security? It's things like user access, development and change, business continuity, and um, are supplemental policies developed and implemented as appropriate for those. And they're asking for you making sure that you have um, uh, you're addressing relevant organizational changes, contractual requirements, and identified threats and relevant changes to applicable laws and regulations. So it isn't all just a technical thing. They're asking for whether your policy morphs and changes due to changes in the law around it. For other things too, like for instance, this is a, they're asking about things like your door locks and the keypads and locked windows and a functioning alarm system and ID cards and visitors being escorted and documents being reviewed of access logs and CCTV and so forth uh, and loading areas being monitored. So it's not just, am I got computer stuff covered? They're actually asking about your physical security. And then um, they'll also ask things that are even harder to discern like your firewall limitation and what level at which you're able to show a, a level of protection that's more than just, you know, installing Norton and then just leaving it alone. I mean, there's there's a lot of complicated elements to it. And if you don't have the answers to these questions and you don't have someone at your office who can answer these questions, it's not going to go well if the GDPR ever comes knocking and asks for the answers. What you'll need to do is find a way to then, you know, uh, appoint a data security officer who then is familiarized in all these things and can answer all these questions with, you know, a definite, you know, yes, or that, you know, we're working on it or something that's that has the plausibility that it's a, a situation that's being addressed as opposed to, well, I don't know what a DMZ is. I don't know what in, in, inbound and outbound points are protected by firewalls, by an intrusion system. I don't even know what that is. Well, if you say that to the GDPR, you'll be in trouble. So it's better that you get answers to these things now and figure out what your situation is or have your clients figure out what their situation is rather than wait until the very last second. And then here's an even more comprehensive 
uh, thing that's talking about um, uh, penetration uh, testing practices and being able to do things like um, check to see if there are vulnerabilities, uh, which is also sometimes called a pressure test. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So you have to say, have you done it within 10 days, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, sort of periodic period, periodic level do you check your system to make sure it's okay. So it's pretty important stuff. And they're asking for some very specific items. So where do we start here? We want to acknowledge the threat. Just don't shrug it off. We want to have pre-breach planning. So in other words, things like security status, test defenses, inventory of assets, data, and, and access them. You know, and who has access to the system and what access do they have? And then you want these things to be current and not, like, not just a one-time thing. Then you want to have breach detection and defense system. You want to know what it is and how it works and if it's working and, and how has it defended you in the last few weeks or months or days or whatever. And then you want a breach response plan of action so that when something like this does happen or an if something like this does happen, you want to be able to say, okay, after, you know, half an hour, we did this, you know, first describe how you found out of the breach and then what you're doing to respond to it, to, to fix it when it has a problem. And then finally, you want to have that uh, breach response plan of action created and written down somewhere so that GDPR authorities or California Privacy Act authorities can look at it and say, okay, they had a plan that was already put together at the time that they uh, uh, wanted to, you know, the time this breach happened. So um, I'm just going to explain quickly about one of the ways that uh, you can be proactive and find out about whether or not you have a, a security problem. And that's, uh, there are other benchmark testing uh, places, but the FICO, the ones that do the uh, credit score, have created a security score that is actually very robust and very accurate. And much like the credit score, uh, green score in the high 600s or 800, 700 or 800s is good, and a red and orange score that are in the 500s, not so good. So down in the 300s, you have a, a 40%, a four, I'm sorry, a 44 times more likely chance to be hacked than you do when you're in the greens and in the high 700s. So, but what's good about it is it's an ongoing score. So you can see over time how your security has gotten stronger or weaker of actions or inactions that you've done. Um, the FICO score runs 10 pages worth of tests and does a whole bunch of different things that help determine how strong and secure your system is. And again, when it gives issues, it gives instructions or it gives you a code that you then look up to see what is not being covered or taken care of. You can use that as a way, as a, a guide to help you secure your system and make sure you get a better FICO score. So things like open ports, M house, details of global in breaches and incidents, and then firm demographics are all combined together to get you that security score. So some summary observations, and that is that new cyber threats are emerging daily. And that there are new laws and regulations happening all the time in regards to it. You got to demonstrate taking due care to protect private information at all times. And it's when you don't show that, that you're taking due care that you have the greatest liability. Uh, you need to be familiarized with the GDPR and what it's asking for. And then we have the New York and California law. And as far as what I've heard is that it's up to the states to come up with their own privacy laws, and we may have a patchwork quilt of 50 different uh, uh, privacy laws. So definitely learn the ones from your state, but also in states that you're doing a lot of business with. Um, there's new and evolving technical solutions, de decision paralysis, because people just don't know where to go or what to do. Um, same with the hacking, phishing, ransomware business. Those are all key areas of risk. You want to take 
uh, you want to uh, do something if you know there's something wrong. You, you've got to show some level of proactivity to show that if there is hacking, phishing, or ransomware that occurs, that you're on top of it. And um, I'm involved with a company called Cyber 631 that um, it works with providing the uh, monthly subscription to get your FICO score. And then once you get the FICO score, working with other particular companies in a way to help you keep your company safe or your law office safe from these sort of cyber threats and in compliance with things like the GDPR, uh, 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 California Privacy Act, and also your own insurance companies. So um, we are a one-stop shop. We're keeping mind, keep peace of mind for the prudent business owner. Um, and uh, we can incorporate all these things together for a uh, monthly monitoring fee. So it's a, it's a great way. If you don't want to have to handle this sort of stuff, you want somebody else that can handle this stuff to take care of it for you, you can always contact me at Cyber631. Um, the main thing is you just don't want to be this guy. And with that, I thank you very much for uh, listening to this um, uh, uh, lecture. And if you have any questions, you can reach me at the phone number or email address below. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.